I'm here to uh, welcome Austin Hill Shaw. Uh, he has his book out, The Shoreline of Wonder, on being creative. Um, it'll be available after the talk uh, for $10 if you're interested. Yeah, I see Dave here. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Van Riper. I'm the GPAWS program manager here at Google. And I, one, of the, one of the really pleasures of my job is to be involved in setting up these events. But I want to give a call out to Rachel O'Meara, who's been a great 20% volunteer for this program. Couldn't be here today, but she does the vast majority of the work of setting up these GPAWS talks and couldn't be doing this without her help. So I wanted to mention that. And then I also wanted to say, um, People sometimes here at Google think that GPAWS is about group sits. And I just want to, I think I want to take this opportunity at the beginning of this to say it's really about supporting Googlers living more mindfully. And we believe that meditation practice is one of those ways to help people to do that. I think this talk today is really interesting because we're talking about creativity. And I think our mindfulness practice, whatever form it takes, can really inform that. I know the logo, I don't have it up here with me, but the... Uh, GPAWS logo has that little video pause symbol in there. But, um, you know, and it's, it is important to take those pauses, and that's what our program is about. But we live most of our life in flow, uh, just like the video <laughs> in play. So, but it's the time we take for the pause can really uh, add to the quality of the flow and, and, and help with creativity and so forth. And I know that Austin was going to talk a lot more about that. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Austin Hill Shaw. Thank you so much for, for having me here. Uh, the wonderful thing about having a talk planned, especially around things such as mindfulness, creativity, and the workplace, is that it allows me to create sort of a cauldron in my own mind by which I'm trying to understand the, the information better and better so that it can present it in a way that, that is succinct and has a framework that's unified. And there's nothing more than I love than doing that. My mind loves to be in this space of creating frameworks and trying to understand some of the things that, for me, are some of the most important aspects of being a human. And, and it's really it's interesting to have that opportunity to do that. And I'm really happy to be here because it's, it's, this is the opportunity, this is the, this is the place where that starts to get presented. So this is a place where I get to be spontaneous and also help uh, with, with, your, with your help in order to understand the material better. And, but before I get started, first of all, I want to thank Van for all your work in, in helping me get here. Um, and also Rachel O'Mara. This, this talk would not have happened without Rachel O'Mara. Uh, we met a couple year, years ago at the Wisdom 2.0 conference, and she was writing a book called Pause. And uh, pauses are incredibly important in our busy time, and we'll, start to t we'll, we'll talk about what those pauses actually start to look like. And it's, um, anyways, I'm really indebted to her, and, uh, and I'm also indebted, of course, Google. I, 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 in preparing for this, I recognized the first time I ever heard about something called Google as an organization, I was in Cuernavaca, Mexico in 2001, working on a children's library where it was a design build project. So we were basically mixing concrete by hand all day and pouring columns. And so almost every evening we had a tequila tasting where we would sort of relax and during one of those tequila tastings, a person came up and said, hey, you got to check out this search engine. It's amazing. It's called Google. And during the tequila tasting, I thought, first of all, what's so amazing about a search engine? This is 2001. And two, what an interesting name for something, to have something as the a big as number as possible. And, and here you are, this, this, this massive organization with all these these um, uh, tentacles out into the world. So it's really, it's, it's an honor to be here and it's an honor to be a part here, part of the, the GPAWS program, okay? So today I would like to begin with a, a little bit of a, a sense of where this all comes from, right? And in 2004, I was participating in a three month meditation ret retreat, what was called the traditional rainy season retreat. And during that, that retreat, 
I was getting a teaching on what's called the Wheel of Life. And the Wheel of Life is essentially a teaching about how people get stuck in habitual patterns. It's a, what's called a Hinayana teaching in Tibetan Buddhism, but it's basically a map of how people get stuck, including hope and fear, what are called the six realms, and even what's called the 12 Nadanas, in terms of how we habitually relate to the world. And during this talk, I had just graduated from architecture school a couple of years earlier, and I thought to myself when I saw this, I thought, you know, that's not only a map of what they call samsara, or confused existence, it's also a map of how people get stuck creatively. And that planted a seed in my mind during, in 2004 that has never left. It's something that I just mull over all the time. And the really question was, is what is creativity? What is this thing that has such universal appeal, but is often, I think, so misunderstood? Okay? So we're going to start to unpack that, and we're going to unpack that within the context of mindfulness and creativity and also how this applies to the workplace, okay? So before we go on, I'd like to start with the, the end in mind about where we're actually going to with this presentation. And what I mean by that is that I, I want to have the vision about where we're going as we start to Think about mindfulness and creativity together. And for me, it has to do with basically what we call the connecting of heaven and earth. The type of Buddhism that I practice is called the Vaj is Vajrayana Buddhism, which is Tibetan Buddhism. But the idea around, but behind Vajrayana, Vajra means lightning bolt. Okay? And it really is that sense is that what you're doing in the Vajrayana lineage is that you're, and in the practice is you're connecting heaven and earth. That means you're, you're trying to take these, these sort of big spiritual religious ideas but root them into everyday ordinary existence. And not just certain existences, but everything, everything that you do to weave that awareness. Another word for Vajrayana is Tantra, and Tantra means thread. It's a thread of awareness that you're weaving through all activities, okay? So we can see the similarity right now between the Vajrayana, the Vajrayana and mindfulness, where we're going with that. But what I want to do is really create a spot, a spot that represents that place. And it's, and it's experience, it's really beyond words. But I want to invite you all to step into that spot with me. I'm going to put it right here, okay? Right here is where that spot's going to be. But before I go there, I want to recognize, you know, when I come in here, I have my own hopes and fears. I have my own ideas of how this is going to go. I have my own nervousness about the experience, about what may, may or may not happen. And yet at the same time, what I want to do is surrender so that I can be in that flow space that Van was talking about earlier. So I'd like your help in doing that. And I want you to go there with me, okay? So on the count of three, I'm going to step out. Again, here's my partial reality over here. And in just a moment, on the count of three, I'm going to step into the space, into the Vajra space where I'm connecting heaven and earth, okay? One, two, three. So this is the Vajra space, okay? And this space, even though it has a fancy sounding name, it's something that everybody experiences. These practices of mindfulness, meditation, and even the things that we do in creativity are all geared to getting us into this space. Because when we're here, there's a meaning to our life that is beyond words. It's ineffable. But the other thing that happens in this space is not that we're passive, right? Nor are we like hamsters on a hamster wheel. We are in a, in a space with the, the, the Taoists would call Wu Wei, actionless non-doing. A place where being human and being creative and being aware are happening just naturally. And I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Just close your eyes and allow yourself to picture 
a, an instant in your life where you've been in this place, okay? Where you have that sense of profound, enlivening connectedness with everything. And not only that, you were doing things. You had this feeling of making a difference. And even beyond that, you had this experience of feeling alive. And notice how this, this experience is not something exotic, but it's actually home. This is home. It feels so good to be here because this is what we are meant to do. We are meant to be aware and use our awareness. We are meant to create and act upon our innate creativity. And we are meant to connect with others. We are meant to exercise our humanity and the cooperation that's built into our DNA. Even with people that we don't fully understand, we have this incredible ability to cooperate and learn from other people. So you can open your eyes again. So back in the 90s, the late 80s and 90s, um, my first love in terms of probably a mindfulness practice was rock climbing. And for 10 years, I was, threw myself into that sport. And the reason that I loved rock climbing so much was because it put me in this flow state, right? Where I was using my physical body, I was managing my fear and planning my, my energy, right? And I was connecting with nature I spent lots of times in Yosemite. I've climbed all the formations there, all the major formations. And just being on those, those thousand foot spaces, you know, moving up little crystals and crack systems and feeling this sense of your smallness, your tininess in this immense environment was incredibly enlivening for me, right? And it was also, a bit of an addiction, right? Addicted to the adrenalized experience, okay? Addicted to those sorts of things. Addicted to wanting to be there, pushing boundaries, right? And I even, the person that got me into climbing, who was my best friend in college, died in a climbing accident in 1996. So, you know, part of what has led my path of wanting to know more about what it means to be human was that immense loss in my life of not having that person there anymore that I love so much and who took me to these incredible spaces, right? And so I want to talk about this first of all. I want to talk about this place which is the opposite of creativity, okay? The opposite of creativity. What might that be, okay? Just imagine what that might be in your mind. What is the opposite space of creativity? Any idea? Just think about that. What's that? Multitasking, doing a lot of the same to the same time. Great, great. Uh huh. Uh, being, in a rut. being in a rut, right? Being in a rut. Okay. Conformity. Conformity. Yeah, that's exactly. Conformity is one of those. So I thought about this a lot. I used to think that the opposite of creativity was destruction, but I realized that's a paired opposite, right? Anytime something is created, something else is destroyed. You know, if I sit down in front of my piece, a piece of paper to go write something, that piece of paper is transformed from a blank, blank sheet of paper to, you know, it's, now it's got marking on it, and my pen is slowly blood led, right? So destruction is, an, is, a, is, a, is a natural pairing with, with creativity. But the opposite of creativity as an experience is addiction. It's addiction. And I got that from reading a book called In the Realm of the Hungry Ghosts. Um, Close Encounters with Addiction, which I'd highly recommend to you by a guy named Dr. Gabor Mate. But it really, and there's another book called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism by a guy named Chogum Trungpa, where he talked about, you know, 
in our lives, we are addicted to three basic things. He called them the three lords of materialism. We're addicted to materialistic things. We're addicted to concepts, right? And worldviews. And we're also addicted to spiritual experiences, okay? Including substance abuse that falls into those, those areas, right? And he had, and he said, Trunkwood said basically, you don't have to struggle to be free, right? You don't have to struggle to be free. Freedom itself is the absence of struggle. And when you see yourself in that space, right, in the Vajra space, which is your nature, there's no struggle, right? The world's no longer a series of obstacles or coincidences or this or that. It's synchronicity. It's magic. It's flow, right? So that's the opposite of, that's the opposite of creativity. The opposite of creativity is addiction, okay? I'm going to walk over here for a second, and let's talk a little bit about mindfulness and try to identify what the opposite of mindfulness is. Any ideas on that? Ignorance. Ignorance definitely has a component of that, yes. Other ideas? Being present. Being pre- what's that? So having a sense of presence is a part of the mindfulness, yeah. So that's, I agree with that. Okay, good. Obsession. Obsession, right. Yeah, just this sort of, a lot of mental activity, okay. So when we booked, when I booked this talk with, uh, with Rachel and Van, uh, I booked it right before I went into the mountains with my dear friend William. I'm 45 years old and I've known this person for 45 years. And he is the one that got me into meditation in the first place. And I went up there, and on the first day, we're up at 11,500 places, in a place that we've been going for 11 years, where we go practice high in the Sierras. And I said, William, can you help me understand this phenomena of mindfulness? Because with all the hype around it right now, I really have no idea what it is (laughs) anymore. And so we talked about that, okay? And we're going to get into what I think it is, but I want to give you an example of how my, like the, the opposite of mindfulness works itself out in my own life. So I don't consider myself to be a good cook. I grew up in a household where food was not valued. And uh, you know, it's like, it just is about getting fuel in us, but it wasn't you know, a joyful presentation by any means. And so when I find myself in a kitchen, I really feel like I have to concentrate. I have to do work. Right, in order to sort of keep all the different things going. All right? And I found myself often to the cutting board, and I'll actually start to get myself into a semi-flow state every now and then. And inevitably what happens is I think, gosh, I'm being so mindful right now. <laughs> so mindful. <laughs> like it, <laughs> right? And inevitably I'll almost cut off one of my digits or like something <laughs> like that, you know, something will spill all over the place. And it's like, it's like, oh, that's not mindfulness. Whoops. Okay. So the question is, what is mindfulness? And really, the relationship and mindfulness and creativity and the way that I understand it go totally hand in hand. And there's different levels of it. And those are what we're going to explore. The different types of creativity, okay, and the different types of, of mindfulness really go hand in hand. And you have to understand, I started this, this venture on what is creativity outside of a meditation retreat. So there, these, these two are just like, bra- like braided together in my mind, okay? But we're really gonna sh- start to get a sense of what that looks like. So um, let's, first of all, before we go into that, I just wanna create something which, which what I call the ground of creativity. And the ground of creativity is basically whatever is that organizing force that has been here since the beginning of the universe, okay? I mean, if you think about it, the only elements that were in the, in the beginning of the universe were there's mostly hydrogen, some helium, and trace amounts of lithium. Just three elements, right? And now some 14 billion years later, we have this. I mean, it's incredible. Like, I have the screen over here, and somebody's talking on the mic, you know, we can, like, adjusting the sound. He's not even here, and he's orchestrating this thing. I mean, it's crazy what we've come up with, right? And so before we even started talking about human creativity, 
You need to talk about the creativity of the, of, of the universe. And the interesting thing about it is, is there, in this phase of creativity, there's no mindfulness at all. Okay? Mindfulness and awareness exist as a potentiality. There's one view of Buddhist, of Buddhist thought that says, says that actually the universe is brought into being and goes through this period of self-organizing so that you can get conscious self-aware beings so that the practice of ripening and working with karma can start again from the imprints of the previous universe. And I love that idea, right? That you go for, again, it's been about 14 billion years, and now suddenly in this little window of time we have conscious self-awareness beings, at least in this neck of the words, working on our stuff, right? We're all working on our stuff on some level, okay? So what are the three principles of what I call the ground of creativity, right? One is what I call dynamism, okay? Dynamism is basically that things are always moving and changing. Everything is moving and changing. And within the spiritual realm, you know, this is the laws of impermanence, you know, nothing lasts forever, okay? And so that's something that we have to relate with in order to understand, um, understand our lives and, and organize our lives around that because the changes in things are one of the things that actually promote our creativity, okay? Now, if we go over here, the next thing that we have, which is related, is interdependence, okay? Things are always changing, right? But they're always changing in relationship to other things, right? Think of the law of universal gravitation, that everything out there in the universe is affecting, all the matter out there is affecting other matter. And, and, then, <laughs> and then you step into the third component, which is essentially, Sometimes when I'm talking to organizations, like business organizations, I call it diversity, right? But my favorite word for it is, going back into the center, mystery, right? Or mysterious complexity. We really don't know how the universe began, even though we have theory or what's before it. We really don't know how life began, although there's ideas around it. And we really don't know where conscious self-awareness is. These things that we rely upon every day that are the groundwork of our lives we're not even totally sure how they came into being. So mystery is not a thing that's a bad thing. When we're able to step into that mystery, we find our lives being really, um, how to say, um, full of wonder, right? When we can drop the need to know all the time, we drop into the space of wonder. That's why I titled my book, actually, after many years of thinking about it, the shoreline of wonder on being creative. It comes from a quote from Methodist minister who I wrongly ascribed the book to a guy named Houston Smith, who's a religious scholar. Um, and uh, anyways, this person said, the larger the island of knowledge, the longer the shoreline of wonder, right? The larger the island of knowledge, the longer the shoreline of wonder. Like we will, we, have, we know so much, right? And yet, at this, and that knowing is great, but it is unbelievably eclipsed by all the things that we, we can't know, we won't know, we'll never know, and yet are allowing us to live out our lives. So that sense of mystery, okay? So again, the ground of creativity consists of dynamism, interdependence, and mystery, okay? Now, before we go on with that, um, I want to do one quick reading from the book, but I would love to have my friend Dada do it. Would you do that? Uh, yeah. Please, come on up. Do we, we have the microphone here? Yes, yes. <laughs> this, is, this is Dada. <laughs> First of all, nice hey, to see Lord. you. It's good to see you. This is a person who's obsessed with creativity as much as I am. And, uh, <laughs> We're friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank oh, this, you. I love this book, and I love the way you just described that image. It's really got me. It's all in there, waiting, just waiting in the time before time. The universe, our universe, packed unimaginably tight, indistinguishably tight, packed into a single point, a point infinitely smaller than a grain of sand, the rawest of raw materials awaiting the miraculous complexity of a single atom. All the solids, liquids and gases that will come from those atoms the stuff of the stars, planets and moons, indeed entire galaxies 
and clusters of galaxies. The cosmic winds, the lines that will become the horizons and the edges of door frames, the plains that will become meadows and the surfaces of alpine lakes, and the volumes that will become oceans and mountains and bathtubs full of splishy, splashy toddlers, the light that will erupt in the east each morning and flood through the kitchen window. The future debates over what to call Pluto, the weight of autumn, and the promise of spring. Orion's belt and Cassiopeia, up and down, near and far, left and right. The carbon atom, the water molecule, semiconductors, bacteria and viruses, fish and flowering plants the early nervous system, indeed conscious self-awareness itself, the awareness of being aware, packed in there too, packed in there with memory and with language, and with all those sparklers of emotions, love, grief, <clears throat> and anger, rubbing shoulders with the asteroids and the dark matter, the possibilities of Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad and Lao Tzu cohabitating in dimensionless space. The cave pa paintings of La Salle, the pyramids of Giza, the, the, the sculptures of Bernini, the paintings of Kandinsky, the soulful jazz improvisations of Miles Davis, polio and the vaccine for polio. Waters fall spectruming through the colors of the rainbow, moonlight on the mountains, and the unrepeatable configuration that is you. All this floating in that awesome sea of nothingness, packed, simply packed, waiting, just waiting like an unlit match or a shrine box, waiting like the bedrock in a fault zone waiting like a landmine in a jungle, feeling in its own strange way the feeling of being so intensely small, hot and dense, having absolutely no way of knowing what it will become and yet becoming everything, with no need to reconcile or repress anything, simply waiting for that improbable moment, that nudge, that flick of the wrist, the magic words uttered, and boom. The universe as we know it began. Thank you. So that sense of togetherness, right? This timelessness, this connectedness, that, that experience of all the things, that potentiality that was there, you know, 14 billion years ago and is now kind of here right now, that is the mystery and the experience of, of, of being in that creative space, of connecting heaven and earth, right? Of sensing the miraculousness of our lives. It's so easy to lose touch that our lives are so utterly dependent on everything all the time. <laughs> Right? And the beauty of our lives is that as human beings, we're, this is often called the desire realm, but it's also called the enjoyment realm. We really get to enjoy experiencing life. Right? We get to eat food, taste it, and our bodies take, take care of the rest. And beyond just that, you know, there's like a three to five pound mass of things that aren't even our DNA. They're helping to process us. This idea that you know, us as individuals is right we're really ecosystems and we're ecosystems that are here but they extend outwards to you know to infinity really and that is the ground of creativity and that's the thing that we're tapping into that sense when we're having these 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 moments that we're going to talk about in just a second okay so again right here we have the vajra space remember that's the center that's the center okay now i want to step into over here all right vajra space here I'm over here in a place, what should I call, the experience of insight. The experience of insight. And this is the aspect of creativity where we have those aha moments. Right? Those aha moments are, like, you know, it's a light bulb going off over, on top of our heads. And it has that ex experience of something coming to us. OK? 
Okay. So one of my, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a lover of creativity and innovation, one of my favorite stories about the Bay Area comes from a, an insight that to, to, still just blows my mind. And you have to go back to, we have to go back to Cincinnati, Ohio in 1889 to see where this actually happened. There was a gentleman by the name of Joe who was 19 years old at the time and was a sophomore at uh, the University of Cincinnati and he decided he was going to go on for football practice, right? And he was Jewish in a time of rampant anti-Semitism and he was only a little bit over five feet tall. And as the story goes, he went out onto the field and was brutalized. Brutalized before practice even began. Brutalized so much that he ended up on a hospital on the banks of the Ohio River. Well, Joe's bed, and he was, out, he was in and out of consciousness for two weeks, as the story goes. Okay, this is, he got, he got throttled, right? So, as the story goes, here he is, he's in his hospital bed, and his, he has a window that's looking out over the Ohio River. And spanning that river is the longest suspension bridge at the time in the world, which was known as the John A. Roebling Suspension Bridge designed by the same guy who, who designed the Brooklyn Bridge. And we don't know what happened in those two weeks, but we can imagine, again, him in and out of consciousness, that he's probably saying to himself, you know, I'm not going to be a very good football, football player, but I might be a good bridge builder, right? Because that young Joe would go on to be Joseph Strauss, who is the chief designer and engineer of the Golden Gate Bridge, right? So this is an experience of insight, right? And the way that I understood this was actually, I looked around for what, what is an insight? What is the defining features? A guy named William James who wrote a book called the, the Varieties of Religious Experience, specifically the chapter on mysticism, he gave it all to me. He said, basically, a mystical experience, which is basically a unitive experience with something larger than yourself, has these qualities. It's ineffable, right? It's beyond words. It comes with a sense of absolute truth, right? They're usually brief. They can be like micro instances, sometimes several hours, sometimes a series of days, but not much longer than that, okay? And they tend to be passive, right? Think of Joe on his hospital bed. He's having this thing coming to him in his most compromised state. And the, the final thing is, is it happens in the minds of individuals, right? Often in mindfulness and spiritual traditions, you get the sense of that, the, that the, the individual needs to let go of their individuality, right? And I agree, we need to let go of the ego structures that bind us and keep us in addictive states, right? But it's great when we actually recognize that our lens on the world is unfathomably precious. Nobody, nobody is ever going to see the world quite the way we do. And we're changing all the time, too. So that experience of our lens on, on the world, in the here and now, is unbelievably precious. Okay? So this is, the experience of, uh, this is the experience of insight. Now, in the language of mindfulness, this is what you're doing when you're meditating. Specifically, when you're meditating, when you're doing what's called shamatha vipassana meditation, one type, which is, shamatha means dwelling in peace, and vipassana means insight. The idea is that you're, you're watching a focal object, okay? Normally your breath, okay? You're watching your breath go in and out. Sometimes you're doing it sensorily. Sometimes you're riding your breath experientially, but you're focusing on your breath, okay? Now, how many of you are meditators in the room, okay? How often would you say that when you're on your, you have your focal object, are you actually on that focal object? Let's say like, Maybe you're there 90, 95% of the time. How many people do that during their meditations? Right, good, okay. How about 50% of the time that you're actually watching your breath? Okay, all right. <laughs> what, about, what about, let's go 20 to 30% maybe, all right, cool, all right. What about like most of the session is basically you watching your mind go <laughs> Right, okay. So, <laughs> so the thing about mindfulness is that really mindfulness, I mean, we don't want to beat ourselves up when we're looking for this awareness. Mindfulness in this context is just a realization that we actually are thinking and that we need to go back to the breath, right? 
Does that make sense? It's just that awareness that allows you at some point to go, hello, you're actually not on the focal object. And so that moment, even though sometimes we go, ah, what am I doing? It's really we should be celebrating that. It's like, oh, that's the mindfulness. It's allowing me to return to the breath. And in returning to the breath, we're returning to what we would call wisdom. Okay? Wisdom in the Buddhist tradition is defined specifically as primordial knowing before thought intervenes. Primordial knowing before thought intervenes. Think of Joseph Strauss there on the bed. His, his executive functions are probably not working so well. And yet his primordial knowing, right? And we're all indebted to that. We're all indebted. I look at the Golden Gate Bridge and I just want to cry, it's so beautiful. The Art Deco, like the, just the span, looking at the camber from the East Bay, it's just, it's unreal. It's so beautiful, right? And it came from that experience, that aha moment, okay? So this is, this is mindfulness phase one, right? And in the Buddhist tradition, we would call this the Hinayana, the focus on, it's on the individual, right? It means the narrow path, the narrow path, the Hinayana, the narrow path, okay? And the, the archetype in this is what was called the Arhat, one who tries to exit samsara and move into nirvana. They're like exiting. They're wanting to exit the cyclical existence of the world. That's the goal in this, in this realm here, all right? So let's step off there for a minute, okay? And let's go over here now, all right, on the opposite side, okay? On the opposite side, right? This is what I call manifestation, all right? And manifestation, you know, man, manos comes from, uh, 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 manifestation comes from manos, you know, it's like the, the word for hand. And the idea is like we want to take these ineffable experiences of insight and make them something that we actually can touch, that can be tangible, right? That we can feel, okay? So um, manifestation in this case is basically consists of just the opposite of what we had over here, right? Instead of something being ineffable, we need to be, we need to be able to define it, all right? And then suddenly you have this paradox here, which is like, well, then you have absolute truth over here. You have to be flexible, okay? That's the, that's the thing. It's like your insight in the moment, I think, is absolutely true, but time goes on, and it may not be true five seconds from then, right? It's almost like if anybody's done the I Ching, it gives you a glimpse. You throw the I Ching, and it's like, here's a glimpse of reality in this moment. But as you know, from dynamism and interdependence, things are always changing, always changing. Okay, so we have to be, again, we have to define what we're doing, but we also need to be flexible, right? This is the phase where we also have to be uh, active, right? We have to be, we have to have a sense of like, we're, we're doing things, okay? Um, and we also, this is, the, this is the sense of where we're actually, you know, we're, we're, we're being active there, and we're also learning to um, move it work with other people, right? This is the phase where we start to be work in the sphere of the collective, right? So those are the things that we start to we are starting to contract. We're we're being active. We're going out in the world. We're working with other people. That is the experience of manifesting. Just the opposite of what we have over there, right? Just the opposite, okay? And so one of the things that I love to think about here is that another um, a way of understanding manifestation is. Are, do we have any bass nectar fans out in the audience? Has anybody ever heard of a bass nectar? Okay. So bass nectar is a DJ that's actually was born in San Jose. Okay. And he's right now he's a multi-million dollar act. He's one of the biggest touring acts out there in uh, in the electronic um, dance music scene. And Lauren had a moment of insight too. Um, he was in as an 11 year old boy. He's from San Jose. And it was October of 1989, and suddenly he finds himself he's with his mom um, in the car, and suddenly in October, the Loma Prieta earthquake hits, right? And there he is. And I was actually 19 years old at the time on the Berkeley campus sitting in Sparrow Plaza. So I know what that's like, right? Suddenly around concrete and everything's like shaking like this, but then there was this distinct feeling of like of a water wave moving through Right, moving through the landscape. I'll never forget it. It was so paradoxical. This is concrete, but you could feel the elasticity of the earth. 
So anyways, Lauren is basically, he's an 11-year-old boy. And what he would start doing based on that experience is he would start to try in his own way, either consciously, subconsciously, to, to recreate the energy of that cataclysm. Who's been in an earthquake before, right? Okay. If you notice when you're in an earthquake, there's, there's a couple of different things. There can be fear, right? You experience that. But there's also amazement. You're, you're really tapping into, again, one, the dynamism of the earth, but also the interdependence. It's like those plates pushing against each other and one side slipping. Okay? So Lauren started to explore different things that had that energy. First of all, he was into metal, like really heavy metal music, which had a lot of energy to it. But then he discovered the rave scene, which was all about love and community and people dancing. And then, and simultaneously, while he's growing and having these influences, Silicon Valley is growing up, the technology is coming into being, all the mixing things, all the sound, right? All the speaker technology, they can do ultra high frequencies and ultra low frequencies, right? And now, he plays these concerts that are just, they're immersive experiences where the, he's building up the energy, right? Almost like the energy in the earth, and then he does a drop. Where you get this unbelievably powerful rolling bass line that just moves through you, right? Like water. And, and for people who like his music, it's almost like a spiritual experience. People walk out of there being like, that was unbelievably amazing. Okay? But that is, again, the experience of manifesting. He had that insight years and years ago, and yet now he's translated that into something that offers this incredibly powerful music that is both um, a joy to listen to and is also lucrative. You know, he's made a lot of money. He's a very generous guy. He's given a lot of money back as well. Okay? So that's the experience of manifestation. Now, if we start to look at this in terms of... In terms of um, Mindfulness, this is really the extent of what we call the, pra the paramitas. And the paramitas, there's six of them. I'm going to get them in the right order. Um, the paramitas are basically the idea is that when we're working in the world, there's six things that we want to keep track of. We want to have generosity. We want to have discipline. We want to have patience. We want to have an exertion. And we, have, we want to have a practice of meditation whereby you know, we're, we're constantly refreshing our minds. Right? Those are the five relative paramitas, which are the perfections, the way in which we work out in the world. But then capping all that is what's called the prajna paramita, which is the umbrella of wisdom, which again, like Joseph, um, Joseph Strauss brought into the world, and also Lauren has, it's that driving force that, that makes you continue to move forward towards recreating the experience of insight that you had initially. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So again, those are, the, those are the ways in which you start to work in the world. This is the world of manifestation. And this is the realm in terms of uh, in Buddhism, which is the idea of the bodhisattva. The bodhisattva's role in the world is to keep helping people understand their own confusion and move towards wisdom. And they keep coming back. They say, I'm going to forego my own enlightenment until all people are enlightened, right? That's the realm of the bodhisattva. It's a service role, right? So when you're manifesting creatively, think of how, how can I bring things in the world? How am I serving? Not, how, not only the product or the service that I'm creating or the art form, but how am I serving, moving through things and in my interactions with people? You know, the bigger the project you have, the more you have to collaborate. So the more lives you have in order to touch, okay? This is also the seeds of innovation. This is where innovation starts. In the aha moment, nothing's happening. It's all just experience. But over here, we actually start to get into the realm of, of innovation as well. Okay. So just to show how this starts to work in the workplace, this experience over here, the number one thing that we can do, in my opinion, to promote this sort of aha moments in the workplace is just to appreciate people. right? I have, a, I have a, a five-year-old that just started kindergarten. And uh, it's her second day of kindergarten. She had trouble going to sleep the night before. She woke up late, right? And, um, and it, takes me about, it takes me about 12 minutes to get to her school in a car and seven minutes to get her there on a bike. And I love riding my bike. But it's kind of a cold morning. So I had her on the back of the bike. 
I'm riding her to school. She's just crying. I don't want to go. And I'm like, oh gosh, you know, what's going on here? And so we get to the school and I'm walking her up. She's like, she's like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. And bring her up to the teacher. And I said, Sierra's been having really big emotions right now. She's not really, ha you know, she's, she's pretty tired. And the kindergarten teacher just went down to her level and said, I'm tired too. It takes me about a month to get used to being back in school. Would you mind if your daddy brought you over here and read a book together? And just like that, she felt totally at home. Right? It was like magic. And my heart exploded. I'm like, that, well, you just got her. But that, that's appreciation, right? Just a, and it doesn't have to do with doing anything, right? There's nothing there. It's just she's connecting with her humanity, OK? And then over here in the manifestation realm, you know, if you think about this, what do you think this is? This is just acknowledgment, OK? Especially if you want to do, be, be creative and, innovation, and innovative in an organization, you not only want to acknowledge what a person is, you know, is doing well, but also their attempts when things don't go well. We have to have license to fail if we're actually going to be creative. Right? We, have, we have to have that, that safety by which we can start to feel that we can try things. And we won't be reprimanded if it doesn't go well. So this is just the acknowledgment. Acknowledgment both for things that go right and also for efforts that don't. As Ed Catmull would say, the, the president of Pixar and Disney Animation, he would say, our failures are always investments in the future. And we, we encourage people to fail. Not, not late in the game during production, but early, right? You manage for the failure, because you've got to have it if you want innovation. All right? OK, so let's come back here. So now we're going back to the Vajra spot. All right? And again, this is the space of creative flow. And over there, you know, this, is, this is the realm of, of wisdom, primordial knowing before thought intervenes. This is the realm of compassion. Right? Doing things in the service of others, including the other part of ourselves, right? that higher part of ourselves. Okay? Now, let's go to the center part here. This is what I call self-expression. Okay? Self-expression. It's a word we've all heard, but I like to think of it in terms of the ways the, young, the Jungians use it, okay? and the perennial philosophers use it. And that the self we're talking about is the big self, OK? The big self. The big self that's connected to the vibrant world, all right? Um, has anybody ever seen this book, Good Night Moon? Right? So this, to me, this is a great, great, great example of understanding the two types of awareness that are happening in self-expression. If I open the book, right? In the great green room, there was a telephone and a red balloon and a picture of full color the cow jumping over the moon, right? So this, we go to the next, we go to the next, this next page. This is the realm of self. This is what they would call the divine ground, right? It's the vibrant sense of a, a dynamic, interdependent, mysterious world. And yet, throughout the book, the person keeps focusing on, on things, individual objects, right? In order to create, we need both, right? We need to be able to have those big, great green room moments. We also need to be able to focus on specific tasks, right? So in Buddhism, they would talk about that as the two truths, the absolute truth, which is the great green room, and the relative truth, which is our ability to you know, understand where we stop and the world begins, what we're good at, what we're not good at, what our bank accounts are doing, what things are happening in time. Those two things both need to be honored in there, right? But we're in the middle of this, okay, when we're in the Vajra spot again, in this place of self-expression, we're doing both at the same time, right? We're maintaining this sort of awareness that is here, right? This big awareness, this connectedness, this aliveness that's always there while simultaneously we're making discrete decisions, taking discrete actions, following tasks, anticipating outcomes, working with others, having one conversation after the next, right? And this is the space of creative flow, right? 
And this is what we, this is, this is the place of aliveness in our lives, okay? So the question is, how do we cultivate this in the workplace and in our lives? What are the main things that we need to do here in order to cultivate that, okay? And the main thing here is that we help people to establish their mission and vision and also to hone their craft, okay? So in the United States is amazing because we have people from all over the world who come here and they leave traditions from other places, right? That's the amazing thing. That's why this is one of the most creative and innovative places in the world because everybody leaves their traditions and comes here. But the confusion about being here is that we don't have an overarching narrative of what our lives are about. And that's actually really hard on us if we don't identify what it is that we're actively working on on the big sphere of what our lives are about. So creating a vision, a sense of where you're going in your life, right? And creating a mission is, starts to bring in this need for meaning, right? We all have this intense need for meaning. No other creature quite has that thing. But yet we are the ones that, we, you know, we have, to, we have to understand our lives. So that's the first thing. And when we, when we start to create that, that, that meaning, it allows our lives to, um, again, have direction. The distractions that come up, we go like, oh, that's a good distraction. I should go in that direction. But that has nothing. Or, or here's another thing that's coming at me, but that doesn't have, that's not going to get me where I want to go. And suddenly all the choices that we have, they start to fall away, and you start to feel called into your vocation. You know, what it is you're here to do to offer the world. And everybody is being called to do something in the world. You have to define it. My mission in life is to empower others as creators. Okay, that's my mission. And that's how I think and view the world all the time. How can I empower people, right? I work with a team of designers in an architectural design firm. How can we work together in order to create these, this, 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 this structure for this person? How can we empower the clients to give us our, their deepest beliefs and values and how we can design from that, right? It's constantly, I'm constantly in every interaction with my kids, with my wife, how can I empower them as creators, right? How can I be the person that does that? So that's again, establishing your mission and your vision. The other thing I think is to hone your craft. You know, one thing that we also, we, you know, humans love doing what they're good at, right? There's a guy named Johnson O'Connor, who was a guy from uh, uh, General Electric, who basically recognized um, early in the turn of last, uh, last century that, you know, it's, it seems obvious now, but people are happiest doing things that they're good at, right? And they love, it, they love building upon those skills as well. So in a work situation, we want to figure out, again, what is our sweet spot? What are we good at? Where's our magic come from? And focus on that, and then also look at how we can intersect with other people who have opposite talents, right? Or different things that they can, so we can help one another. That's the joy of collaboration, right? That's the joy of working with one another. And this space, again, this is the arhat, the one that wants to leave and go into the bigness. This is the bodhisattva, one who's actually working in the world but maintaining that awareness. This is what we would call the tantrika, again, the person that in every interaction is weaving wakefulness into every experience as much as possible. And the difference between this space and the other two spaces, okay, this space and that space still have a residue of confusion. Like, I'm a confused person, right? I'm, I'm confused, right? I don't know exactly what to do. I'm wanting to move out of my confusion towards wisdom. When we step into self-expression and we own our creativity, then we're in the space of basically being fully human, right? We are saying, I actually, my basic nature is wakefulness, not confusion. My basic nature is wakefulness, okay? And that's what you feel when you're in the flow state, that your basic nature is to be awake, right? And that's what the mindfulness practice is, and that's also what creativity has to offer, okay? So I know that we went over a lot of information. Um, I just want to offer you this as a way of understanding all the information that we talked about. Again, like I said, I love 
making maps of creativity, spirituality. The Shoreline of Wonder is a Dharma book, but it's geared towards a secular audience. My languaging is always towards how can I intersect the people that need this the most? And in my opinion, it's the ones who maybe don't want to go into the mystery, who want to ignore dynamism and interdependence, right? who want to fixate on their life, who want to retire by a certain time in their life and kind of cruise. This is, this is targeting that. And in the workplace, you know, all these ideas here, again, the ground, which is in gray, and then the other ones, the connection, the making, the difference of meaning, those are the basic needs of being human, which is accomplished through appreciation, appreciation acknowledgement, and empowerment, you know, empowering others as creators, okay? And here's a little bit of a close-up of that, just so you can see it a little better. And if you'd like to see, and if you would like a copy of this yourself, you can go to my website, and you can find it there. If you go to austinhillshaw.com, you can find that. And there's a whole explanation on the back whereby you'll get all the information that we talked about here just a moment ago. So I know that we're coming up really quickly on time. Um, I don't know if you have a moment for like one or two questions. Um, but um, thank you so much. Hi, thanks so much for the talk. Um, I have a question about. So bringing this into the workplace, we mentioned getting to a flow state and the relationship with that between how is that necessarily related to something that is actually beneficial in a larger sense? Um, you know, a company that makes cluster bombs that wants to function with less dysfunction in the workplace, you know, and for, as a, one example. Yeah, that, that does, that's a fantastic question. Um, the question, again, is, is you know, how, if we're entering the flow states, that's great. But what if our outlook is to build a better bomb, a more destructive element, right? So you know, how to say, I, I love humanity. And, and you know, when I'm working with individuals, what I've recognized over the years is like, you know, people want to love and be loved, but hurt people hurt people. That comes from the prison system. The, the, the meanest person in the yard is the one that's hurt people the most, that has been hurt the most, right? So you're right, a flow state can be used destructively, but, it, but the beauty of a flow state when it's working actively is it brings forth a, 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 what I call trans, transmutation, okay? Transmutation is basically moving, it's almost like alchemical, bringing a base substance and making it elevated. But in human beings, it means taking all those hurts, become bottled up in this, the ways we shut away, turn away from our natural creativity into addictive patterns. We face those patterns and we step back in through the process of transmutation. So one of the highest expressions of creativity, in my opinion, is healing, right? And so we can't, we can't make people change, but we can demonstrate through our own insights, our own manifestation, and our own self-expression a different path of doing things. You can't force anybody to do anything, but you can surround them with love and not make them wrong for that, you know? At the essence, this is a path of love, right? And there's things that look like self-expression, which are actually in Buddha Dharma, they would call egohood. Which like you're actually, you think that you're moving towards enlightenment, but you're moving towards, it's almost like mega maniacal, maniacal. So great question. So in the workspace, I would notice that a lot of people are working from this ego uh, maniacal space. They're, they're working for self-interest. They're working to try to get ahead. They're working to try to make a name for themselves. How does one who is trying to work from a, a deeper place, trying to express big self, do that amongst all of these other influences. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, it is, um, one of the ways of understanding this is that I think that, again, none of us go through our childhood unscathed. None of us come into the world unscathed. You know, we, we have the imprints of our maternal lineage, our paternal lineage. And I also think that when consciousness comes in, it's actually, there's other elements that, that are probably not even our own. You know, there are things that are being passed down to us that we are here to work on, right? And, and my understanding is, is basically our core wound, what hurts us the most, for me it was feeling disconnected, right? Starts to become your vocation. So if you sit with that feeling of what's not working for you, and be curious about it, that's what evolves into what your vocation, the thing you're offering it. So for example, here, 
you know, in the realm of the Bodhisattva, Avalokiteshvara is shown with like thousands of eyes. And those eyes are to look out at the suffering of the world, right? To understand the suffering of the world. When you're here, the word is basically make your world a seeming paradise while you feel the pain of a habitual patterns. This is the place of sad joy, which is actually an amazing, amazing place to be. The movie Inside Out explores the theme of sadness and joy together. It leads for a richer life, even though typically we're like, I want more joy, don't want more sadness. I just read last night an article on the geography of sorrow. This, this person asked this African woman, is like, why are you so joyous? She says, because I cry so much. I cry so much, right? Our joy is accelerated and amplified by the more that we can go into our sorrow, our hurt, that, all those things. And, you know, in the workplace, we, that's the conversation we're going to start to get into. You know, we don't want to just say, like, here's my work persona, right? We want to bring all of you. We're better off that way. And how we manage that? Well, we're all still figuring that out right now. How we can be fully human everywhere. Thank you, Austin. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. <laughs>